studio versions of tracks. These are six songs that come off of Thomas's album called The Conformist. So what you're seeing now is these are the finished versions of these tracks, but eventually this material is going to be incorporated into a evening of live performance. And so the pieces, which are now cut as studio versions, will become reinterpreted live using technology of jitter and other things where I'm using a kind of responsive technology. So the loops that I'm working with will work in, in relation to the musical structures. Um, then we'll take a little break because we'll all need booze after that. Um, and I'm going to show two other works. Um, one is from 2005. It's called Every Wandering Cloud. It's seven minutes long. It, is a, it will show you, I think it's a useful transitional work because it shows sort of the origination of the animation that I'm currently working with. And it was inspired by the writing of um, Oscar Wilde. It is an homage to the Ballad of Reading Jail, his famous, favorite, uh, famous poem. And then the last thing I'm going to show you is sort of completely different flavor, which is a commissioned fashion film I made in 1993, which is very rarely been seen. Um, the fashion designer named, named Jeffrey Bean wrote me an insane fan letter after I made my first feature, Swoon, which is still the name. You should all get a fan letter from a fashion designer. What a wild thing that was. Um, and so I made this film, which is inspired by silent movies. It's, it's the longest of the works we're going to look at today. It's 30 minutes long. Um, for those of you who are fans of Claire Danes, it is the official second film of Claire Danes. Um, for those of you who are fans of Vivica Lindor as the Swedish actress, it is nearly the last film of Vivica Lindor. So there you go. We're going to look at Dove Man first, the first six chapters of Dove Man. Did he give you a suit? He did not give me a suit, unfortunately. I got a suit from Jeffrey B. But I got a good lunch at the Four Seasons, so at that stage, that was as good of a suit. These are a continuation of that way of making work. Um, my mother died uh, three years ago, and after my mother, I'm the youngest of 11 children. Yes, 11. Unbelievable. Um, when my mom died, it's hard. My good family uh, is any time a parent dies. And so the aftermath of my mother dying, one of the things I did to sort of deal with it was I went upstate New York where I have a house in the Catskills, and basically every day for that entire summer, I went out at sunrise with a camera, and my assignment was just to pay attention, basically. So I just went and photographed and paid attention for an hour every day, did not speak to anybody, and just photographed for three or four months. So much of what you're seeing is material generated from that. That's the sort of first wave of the materials, all this landscape and the upper Catskills. But when I started cutting the pieces, I realized that I made them in not the order that you're seeing them. But the, So the first piece I made was what's called Tigers of all of them, which is probably the most explicitly about my mother's death in terms of emotion associated with that. Um, 
And then as I moved forward, it became clear to me that actually I could crack open the vaults of the material I had used and use any of my footage that I had shot from any period of time. So for those of you who are familiar with my experimental work, you're actually seeing material from 25 and 30 years ago reconsidered and recontextualized. A lot of my work is about sort of, and you'll see in the next short piece I'm going to show, some of the same imagery repositioned or recontextualized again. Um, so that's sort of the genesis of them, is that they were really kind of movies that were meant to um, impact you all emotionally in the same way that I was impacted emotionally by the events of that loss. Um, they're not really about meaning in some sort of a didactic way. They're really about trying to just um, be expressive emotionally. Um, and that's sort of how they were made. Now, I'm so, you know, I started making one after another, and they took a few months, and now I'm sort of on a clip, and I'm moving quickly. And now what I'm trying to consider is how they might um, potentially be a part of Young Man's live performance. Some of you who are familiar with Young Man's music know that they perform regularly at La Poisson Rouge, pretty much on a monthly basis. And one of the things Thomas is very well known for is collaborating with a lot of different people. So he, each night Young Man plays, different collaborators participate. So I'm starting to see myself as part of the Dove Man house band. <laughs> Except instead of playing an instrument, I make pictures, basically. Um, and the idea is going to be that these things which are very rhythmically tied to the studio track and have a kind of precise cutting shape will change when I start working with them against live music. So um, that's and the, the performative aspect of it probably will involve me actually doing live switching with the laptop and eventually working with the and So that kind of um, sculptural and performative element of it treats me. It's a different way of telling um, stories. So, I don't know, that's a little context about where the movies no. come from. No. Shall we? Yeah. I have a question, because I know from the earlier work there, I think you really chose the music, and, and I don't know if you would have got the rights, but anyway, you cho chose the music. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, that's, that's what I thought I was just talking to my students today about that. And, you know, you know there, it was your choice here, it's a collaboration where he's bringing the music to you, and how is that different? It's funny, actually, Thomas was the kind of the motivator of the collaboration because, Thomas, you are not here in this room. You are arguing, hiding. No, okay, it's mysterious. You can be here. Um, I made it, I directed a movie called Savage Grace. In Savage Grace, the final closing credits is recorded by a musician named Don Landis. Some of you might know Don Landis's work. Don Landis is a frequent collaborator of Thomas. And in the making of Savage Grace, I met Thomas, who at that time was like 27 or something, and he was incredibly bold and said, I want to collaborate with you. And I was like, okay. Um, and so time passed. I saw he had done this cover of the album called Footloose. Like, you know, Footloose, Footloose. But he did a kind of brilliant acoustic version of it, which I heard and loved. And then I went to go see a performance at Miller Theater, actually, in Columbia, where with Nico Muley and other collaborators, they performed much of what was in this album, the performance, which I got right after that. And listen to it, and I kind of was right after my mom. It was like right when my mom died. And the kind of way that whole album worked as a song cycle and the way it created the narrative and all the rest of it inspired me in a different way than I had worked before, where previously I was picking, you know, an individual song, and the previous versions of music videos often were pairing a song with a literary touchstone and had a very kind of specific thing and tended to be more politically didactic. They reflected maybe kind of the activist work I've done more, and I have never really felt at liberty to make something that was like just purely personal um, and sort of did not have any more goal than just engaging you emotionally and showing you something I thought was beautiful. Um, which sort of, I had to be brave actually to do it, because I was like, oh, it's not smart art. I'm just making some sappy emotional thing. Uh, and it is that OK? Um, so I decided it's OK. <laughs> Whether you guys think it's okay or not, I still think it's okay. So, and I think that's this is a different thing because now I'm considering a complete work of another maker who's given me total latitude to do whatever I want to do. <coughs> We've avoided some usual tropes of music video. You will not see Thomas lip syncing. Probably you will never even see Thomas in any of his work. Um, but I am starting to shoot material specifically for these tapes. Like when I've traveled in the last year, I'm starting to generate material with the idea in mind that I'm going to cut. Um, and that's it, maybe something different because in the past I would always shoot specifically for a piece. Now I have you know hundreds of hours of footage in super edited digital video that I'm you know in a kind of very associative way crafting that material open and using whatever seems like it's been.
of, I don't know. It might be on its own, basically. <laughs> and I'll probably make nine or 11 of these. So I'm starting, I'm working on two new ones now, and when I finish nine or 11, that'll decide how many can sustain an evening's work. I don't think, I never want to make something that overstays its welcome. I'd rather make something that you finish and you're like, okay, I want a little more, rather than, God forbid, please <laughs> turn it off, <laughs> I'm done. Um, and then how the thing will come to life in terms of the um, live performative thing is going to make it, is probably the most exciting thing to me in the, this collaboration, because I've done a lot of work that could be considered music video. I just literally did this, uh, I did a music video for a band called Mirror Mirror, which if you're friends with me on Facebook, I will be posting you on mm. Facebook <laughs> a lot later in the year. So, and that's a totally different way of working where I was accountable to a label and, you know, I, I had to think about it in a different way than I made this. This I'm not really, I'm not talking to anybody about it when I'm making it. It's completely, it's like diary writing. It's completely individual um, work.